Hi, I'm Mark. Welcome to Start Making. Which hand plane should be your first? I found it incredibly intimidating when I was watching all of these woodworkers with hundreds of planes hung up on the wall behind them. I couldn't figure out which one they needed, which one was display, and which one was their first. I own somewhere in the region of 20 different hand planes, which isn't a massive amount, and I'll probably use seven or eight of them. So what have I got? I've got the vintage number five, I've got number four, I've got number four and a half, I've got the low angle sweetheart jack plane, another number four, another number four, stub nose shoulder router plane, plow router stub nose single ski plane, a double ski, double edged, super bladed, Stanley, and I got a block plane. I may have made up a couple of those names. So I'm gonna start the video recommending which one is gonna be the plane that I suggest for you as your first one, and then we're gonna finish it with some seriously handy tips. Ways that will get you past all the pitfalls that I fell into at the start, and hopefully, for those of you in the early stages of your journey that are struggling and getting very frustrated with a hand plane, hopefully I'll iron out some of the creases that you're experiencing. Now, if you are a hobbyist, as I expect most of the people watching this video are people like myself, then what do you really think you need to use your hand plane for? Genuinely speaking, I didn't know the answer to this question when I first started out. I assumed that it was a butcher's tool that was to remove as much wood as quick as possible and as heavy cuts as possible to get the job done quickly. That was so, so far off the mark. Samsonite. I was way off. You see, it's not a butcher's tool, it's a finesse tool. And if you treat it as such, look after it as a precision item, then it will enhance your work in a way you never would have believed possible. A hobbyist needs a plane for a very few specific jobs. Removing wood, straightening and taking out twists, bumps and undulations in a piece of wood. You need to flatten the sides. You might need to do a little bit of jointing and some smoothing down. That all sounds really complicated, but everything I've just named there can be done with one plane. Now there's gonna be people shouting at the screen saying that that is not the case, they need more than one hand plane. You're absolutely right, but you needed to start with one. The speed in which you progress to your next one is determined by what type of woodworker you are. Every single woodworker that there is belongs on this chart, where everybody on the top is only power tools and everyone at the bottom is only hand tools, and then you've got the spectrum in between, the hybrid woodworkers, like myself. Where you sit on it determines how long you will have your first hand plane for before you update it. Now, I don't believe there's anybody out there that has entirely power tools and zero hand tools of any kind. Now the bottom though is another case. There are people out there that have all hand tools and zero electric tools at all. I sit sort of a third of the way up. I don't have power, so I kind of the big tools. And there's people a bit further up that have got more of the power tools, such as your table saws and your outer tables. Every single one from the very bottom up to just shy of the top needs a hand plane. My personal opinion is the ones at the top near the power tools will probably have that one hand plane for a lot longer without adding more to the collection than the ones further down. So figure out where you sit on that. I had one hand plane probably for about six months and then I added to it after that. But if you're lower, you might add to it after a week. Lower down, might even get two or three very quickly after the first one. The thing to remember with a hand plane is, not only will it make your job harder, but it will also tear into your work in ways that it's not meant to if it's not set up right and if you're not using it right. So that's why I've put some tips at the end to get the best out of whatever hand plane you pick because you do need to also navigate through all of the difficulties that it's gonna bring you. There's only one way of doing this and that's to get rid of the ones we don't need. And that's to get rid of the ones we don't need. So, what are we left with? We've got the new low angle Sweetheart Stanley plane. Those are the right words, they might be in the wrong order. You've got the vintage number four. You've got the vintage Stanley Bailey number five. And then you've got our trusty block plane. You will need this at some stage, but you can get away without it, so it won't be the first. Before we start down the road of which way you should go, let me share my journey of which way I went so that you can have the best example of which way not to go. It's terrible. This is straight from one of the DIY stores. I went out, I picked it straight off the shelf. I didn't look at it. I just thought that'll do a job for me. I was very wrong. If you have one of these in your shed and it is your only hand plane, and you are struggling, and you're not getting the results you want, I'm afraid it is time to put this to one side. But before you rush out and replace it, without giving it much more thought, 
know that one of these three is a game changer. Now the easiest way to separate these is to look at the pros and cons of each individual plane. Let's narrow down the vintage planes to one and then put that one against the newer plane. Let's go with the number four, where I started. This was the plane that your everyday handyman or your household DIYer would have in their toolbox. So there are lots around. They're easy to find, they're cheap to get. I'm only talking about the UK here at this because that's all I have experience with. And more importantly, they are really easy and quite enjoyable to refurbish. So you can pick up one in relatively poor condition and get it to work for you. They're tactile and they're light. And if you are looking at smoothing a piece of wood with undulations, this does a very good job of it. But it does have drawbacks. The iron that comes with it is a significantly thinner iron than you get in the newer planes. Now that tends to judder, it doesn't hold an edge as well. The metal might not be the same standard as the newer ones. You do have to check that they haven't got bends and damage to them when you get it. I think the shortness of the base on it will hold it back from certain jobs. Sticking with the vintage, we move to the number five. Most things about this are similar. The only difference really being is the length and having that extra bit of metal, obviously it's a little bit heavier. I found using this, having a longer base on it, when you're actually using it on a job, you can get a better feel for it. You get a better read through the wood. It takes in more of the wood to settle itself. It rides on those high spots. And importantly, when you get to the end of a piece of wood, it doesn't tip because you have more of the tail actually still seated on the wood because the blade is set with so much distance behind it. Like the number four, this is easy to refurbish and that extra length does mean you can use it to join boards together. The iron or the blade is exactly the same as the one you get in the number four, so it's thinner and it has to be put in as a drawback. If you want a vintage hand plane as your first one, go with the number five. It will make you a better woodworker than the number four will. Now we should give a bit of time to the basics, box store, hand plane. No, God! No, God, please, no! No! Pros, it's light. No! No! That's all I've got. Cons, it's terrible. Let's go now to the Stanley jack plane. This has a significant weight advantage over the other two. It's heavier. You can feel it when you're working it and you can feel it just holding it. It's a really weighty bit of kit and that helps you when you are doing a lot of planing. It drives that iron through the fibers. That's a generally more accurate build across due to the level of machining and the metal quality of every part of it is better. The wood quality is not. However, you do get a larger handle at the back so you can get your whole hand around it instead of the three finger grip that you would use on the vintage planes. We've talked about the irons. As I said, this has a far superior level of steel. It's thicker, it's harder, it holds the edge better and you get a better job with worse sharpening. When you have a plane that is bevel up, i.e. the blade going in like that, and you have your vintage ones, which is the bevel down because they have the chip breaker on the top. I would have thought the angle difference would be massive, but actually there is around about a two degree difference. You don't need to worry about the angle as part of the reason to change between these two planes. The last little bonus you get with the Sweetheart Jack plane is an adjustable mouth. You can move the front part of the plane here to open and close the mouth where the wood shavings go through to prevent tear out and chip out from the wood. You don't have a chip breaker like you would on an older plane. And even on an older plane, you've got to move the frog back and forwards and adjust the level of the mouth to stop it. A normal piece of wood when you're planing with the grain, generally speaking, you don't need to close that mouth right off because you're not gonna get tear out. But on a piece of wood that's got wavy grain or potentially if you go against the grain, if you've got no other choice, that's when you close the mouth right down. As the wood chips up, it snaps it off quicker and it reduces your tear out on the piece. So what's the drawback? In all honesty, the only one is the cost. 150 pounds compared to 10, 15, 20 pounds. 150 pounds is a lot of money. And I'm not saying that you should all be spending that much money on your first hand plane. What conclusion can we draw from this? If you've got the funds, get yourself one of these. It doesn't have to be this brand, it can be any brand of your choosing. The reason I'd say if your funds can stretch to this, that this is the way to go, is one, 
overriding factor that I found with it. I sharpened the iron in this to the same level and with the same ability that I sharpened the number four when I had that. But the results I got from this were incredible. There was night and day difference. And I put that down to the build and the quality of the steel within the iron. It gave me the confidence to go back to the number four and to practice with it and learn what it took to get that up to the same level of performance as this. So I'm not saying never get a vintage plane if you can afford one of these. What I'm saying is get one of these to build up your confidence. Then you'll be able to use any plane that you find. If you need to be a little bit more careful with your funds and the money that you invest into your hobby, which frankly is not a cheap one, you should go for the number five Stanley. You may have a steeper learning curve. It may take a little bit longer, but you will get there with this plane. And perseverance and sharpening will get you there. Don't give up. I tend to go on and on and on about sharpening, but it is so, so important. You could go out and get the best plane and eventually when that blade goes dull and you don't know how to sharpen it, you may as well be planing that wood with a rasp. And sharpening is simple. It's cathartic. It is a routine that you put into place that will eliminate mistakes within your work and it will only raise your game. But you have to have a setup that works for you. I've got a sharpening video on my page. Have a look. It is a good video with three steps. Keep it simple. If you're finding this video useful, please hit the subscribe, leave me a like. But most importantly, if you've got tips, comments, anything that you want to add, that's where we learn. Let's say you've chosen your plane. There are still pitfalls and hurdles that you need to get past. And these tips will hopefully alleviate a lot of them. It's just a simple tea light candle. Before I do any job using a hand plane, I just zigzag it down the sole and that's it. If you're working against the friction on the bottom of the sole, you're going to be losing feel for the wood. You're not just gonna be feeling the shavings that you're taking, you're gonna be feeling the grind underneath it. Also, you're gonna be putting in a load of effort that you don't necessarily need to be putting in. That does also lead me on to number two. Understand what a plane can and can't do. Don't ask too much of it. And by that, I mean, don't look at a piece of wood and think you can take half a centimeter off it, five mil, three mil, with two or three passes. These are finesse tools. And if you've got it waxed up on the bottom and you're taking multiple passes, lots and lots of thin layers, what you're leaving behind is a nice burnished surface underneath and you will be very, very proud of the finish as opposed to the opposite. One of the most important things to do with the wood just before you plane it is to stroke it. Bizarre, isn't it? The reason you're going to do this is to check on the grain direction. You should always be planing with the direction of the grain. So if you imagine stroking a cat, you would stroke in one direction because all the furs are lined up. You'll stroke very smoothly. If you go against it, you're going against the different fibers of or the hairs of the cat and you will get tear out because they will push back up instead of cutting. So when you get a piece of wood, what you want to do is just either stroke it to feel which direction the fibers are going in and then plane with them, or take a good look at the side of the board. Now, you'll see the side of the board, the fibers flick up in one direction, and that is the direction you want to be planing in. There are certain woods that will throw you a curveball. This one is one of my favorites, but it is also one of the hardest to plane. This is Sapel. The reason for that is because the grain moves in different directions as you move down the board, and it's very tight. So it just makes for a harder job. There's a couple of different ways to deal with this. If you have one of the modern planes, close the mouth off and that will alleviate the chip out when you get to the wrong directional grain. Or if you come to a bit that has got the grain going in the other direction and you're halfway down the board, don't be afraid to switch direction and then meet in the middle. It's a bit harder to keep the levels right, but you will definitely get a nicer finish or finish off with a card scraper. Finally, chamfering. Chamfering is great when it's going with the grain, really easy but when it's going across the grain, you tend to get tear out. So the best advice I've heard is for every stroke you do along the grain, do that first and count your strokes, do one less going across. Understand the anatomy of your hand plane. And by that, I mean, get your hand plane, take it apart, clean it, strip it back, understand where all the moving parts are and how they move, oil them, look after them, because then it will look after you. 
If something's not working right, if you've looked at how the plane is made up, you'll understand what it is that is creating the movement, the slop, the vibrations, whatever it is that you're feeling through your arms, you will be able to translate to the body of that plane so you can fix it. When you get shavings in the mouth of the plane, take your time on every pass to clear them out. They will jam, they will make your job harder, they will create markings on your work, but also if you take them out by hand, especially with this heavy jack plane, you won't be tempted to do the sideways flick. Don't do that. Just clear them out every time on every pass. Understand where the wood's going and where it can block up. When you start planing a piece of wood, you start with the, pla with the blade backed up as far as you need to, so it's not taking a shaving. And then you gradually move the blade out until you start taking a shaving. What that does is it ensures that the iron is always, or the blade is always under tension. If you back the blade off during a cut, there's a little bit of slop and you won't get anywhere near as accurate or as good a finish as you should get. So what you should do is if you are taking too heavy a pass, back it off further than you need to and then bring it back in so that you always keep that blade under tension. Understand your own anatomy. Understand where your strength comes from, where your stability comes from and your bases. If you are only planing with your arms, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, you're tiring out a potentially weak and lighter part of your body. If you lock them and rock from the hips, you're gaining control, you're gaining strength, and you will be able to plane for longer without tiring. As I said, I've got a whole video on sharpening. There are a couple of points that I want to make from that video and they are super, super simple. Set yourself up a sharpening station. Don't cover it, don't throw stuff on it, have a system. Use a honing guide if you are learning because it will regiment everything. Once you have a system, you repeat it, it'll be quicker and you can perfect it. You'll get a better edge every single time you sharpen. But that's not enough. How you sharpen is totally up to you. Whether you want to use whetstones, diamond plates, whether you want to use the scary sharp, sandpaper on glass method they all work i wouldn't switch between them i would just take one and run with it the most important tip is how often you do it do it before you think you need to simple as that you may not be feeling blunt but it's blunter than when you first started that job and if it was sharp enough to start that job and it's blunter now you definitely need to get it back to the sharpness of the start of the job because that's better so your work will be better your finish will be better and no tune-up is complete without a strop it's just a piece of leather onto a piece of wood with polishing compound on it, taking sharp to razor sharp. That's it. You will see that mine over the last couple of cold months has actually developed a layer of very thin layer of rust on it. Now I can get this off with some sandpaper, um, but it should never have been allowed to happen in the first place. Give them a coating of oil. I use three in one. Some people use olive oil on the non-moving parts. It's up to you. Choose one that you like and just give it a light coat and it will just protect it against the elements. Now this is a really, really simple one, but you will see people in videos wiping the shavings off the bottom of their hand plane. Just remember to go from bottom to top, wiping this way so you don't encounter the blade. The final tip I want to leave you with is remain positive. Don't overthink it. All of this video is to try and simplify the entire process of putting that hand plane in your hands on the wood and getting a good job out of it. And if you get to that stage, you should be congratulating yourself and it will only grow from there. That's your hand plane sorted. You've got the new one in your hands. The next thing you need to do is learn how to sharpen it. And that's what this video is for. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you over there.